In this video, I'm going to look at a subject that affects pretty much everyone. It is a subject that many will find hard to listen to and even harder to put into practice as it flies in the face of our human nature and how the world tells us we should behave. The subject I'm going to look at today is the subject of forgiveness. And I do not say this lightly, but I think that Christian forgiveness is one of the hardest principles to implement. I dare say that it is easy enough to forgive someone you don't know if they bump into you when walking around the corner. But I think it is far easier to forgive a stranger for a minor infraction than to forgive someone you were close to for having a negative impact in your life. And I'm sure that you've had some experience of this, as I have, of being hurt by someone close to you. So I want you to understand that as I talk through this subject, I'm not suggesting that this is an easy thing that will take no toll on you as a person. And so it is with that knowledge that this is a difficult subject to cover emotionally that we turn to the scriptures to see what it teaches us about forgiveness. The first verse which gives context to the first section is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It is the responsibility of the Christian to become more Christ-like. We must look to Christ to be the example of how we should conduct ourselves. And so we will look at how Christ acts in forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here we have the condition upon which we can have our sins forgiven in God's sight. We must confess our sins, not to a priest, but to God. But you will note that in our confession, God is not expecting us to list every sin. He does not say that you must produce a catalogue of every failure and how it impacts God in order to have your sins forgiven. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It does not say he will cleanse us from some. It does not say he will cleanse us from the minor ones, but the major ones must have some evidence of works first to cover them before they are forgiven. It says all. You will also note that in the case of God's forgiveness, we are forgiven positionally for sins we have not yet committed. As we are time-bound humanity, I think that this aspect uh, need not be carried over to the Chris Christian expectation of forgiveness. We go on to see, though, that God does differentiate between positional and relational forgiveness. So you say, in order for someone to be able to be forgiven, they have to ask for forgiveness. Perhaps we should read Luke chapter 23, verses 33 and 34. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus is being crucified by men who hate him. They have not confessed their great evil. And yet Jesus has forgiveness in his heart. Why? They do not know what they're doing. There will be times in our lives where people pour salt in an open wound. Not out of malice but out of ignorance. I know a couple who would dearly have loved to have had children, who were doing everything they could to start a family. When God finally answered their prayers, a Christian made a comment about how they'd finally decided to settle down and start a family. 
That comment caused a huge amount of hurt, as if the couple had not cared to have children. Do you think that comment was meant to cause hurt? Did they need to confess the sin in order to be forgiven? I don't think so. Can we look dispassionately into the situation and give the individual the benefit of the doubt to establish if their actions were out of malice or if they were not fully aware of the result of their actions or speech? The next passage that speaks into Christ-like forgiveness is Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. It is not just that God forgives us our sin for a little while, then we, when we fail again, the whole back catalogue of wrongs are thrown into our faces. When God forgives us, our sins are removed from us as far as from the east is from the west. Not even as far as the north and the south. As I'm sure you know, no matter how far west you go, you will never get to the east. North and south are a fixed point. East is always east of where you are. Are we just looking for the moment when someone we have claimed to have forgiven fails us again so that we can unload all our previous failures onto them? Like the dam that bursts causing devastation downstream, devastation that may never recover. The writer of Hebrews quotes Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews 10 and verse 17, when he says, Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. He will remember them no more. Does this mean that God is removing them from his memory? Not really. God knows everything. He's omniscient. What it means is he will not actively remember them. He will choose not to think of them. We do not have the same control over our minds and emotions as God does in his perfection. But we can, when a memory of how another has injured us, make the conscious choice to cast it from our mind in the same way we would an evil thought or sinful desire. We must take control of our minds in this regard. But surely you say we cannot be expected to forgive, after all, to err as human, to forgive divine. It is God who judges and God who forgives, not us. Well, first of all, that is from a poet, not the Bible. Secondly, we are commanded by God to forgive. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So not only are we commanded to forgive, but forgive just as Christ forgave us. Not man's style of forgiveness, but God's way of forgiveness. When we read Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 through 14, it seems to be taken for granted that we will forgive when it says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. As we have already forgiven our debtors. This is not just financial. Of course, we can ask for God's forgiveness because we have already forgiven our debtors. The passage, though, goes on in verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Read that carefully now. If you do not forgive others, God will not forgive you. Now, be careful what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that this verse means that you can lose your salvation 
if you do not forgive. But rather, you will not have a good relationship with God if you do not forgive others. This is not a question of your position, but your relationship. Jesus is basically saying here that if you want to have a good relationship with God, you will have to have a good relationship with each other. Remember that Jesus was talking only to his disciples in this passage. And so we can use that context to help us understand what he's saying. So our relationship with Jesus is affected by our unforgiving attitude towards others. Now that's a big thing. Just read Mark chapter 11, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who also is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. When we are praying, we must forgive. Could this mean that our lack of forgiveness can be affecting God answering our prayers? Is that desperate prayer that we bring regularly before God not being answered because we are not forgiving someone? James would suggest this is in fact the case. James 5 verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This verse would suggest that the good relationship between Christians is the foundation for powerful prayer. So what does this look like? What should we be doing? What should we be feeling? What perspective can we bring into the situation? To start off with, I would suggest that we consider who has been wronged. Remember when the prodigal son returned to his father, he said, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. The young man first acknowledged that his primary debt was to God, not his father. So we must acknowledge that when we have been wronged, the primary damage is not to us, but to God. Yes, we have been wronged, but we are a long second place in comparison to God's righteous call upon that individual's life. Read the parable Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18, verses 22, sorry, 23 through 35. See the comparison in our circumstances. See the warning Christ gives in verse 35. Notice the use of the phrase, forgive them from your heart. We are to have an emotional change in respect to the person we are forgiving. And so God's claim comes before our own. We should look at how God has reacted to that person and ourselves in order to understand how we should treat them. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Remember first that Christ died for them, just as Christ died for us. The person who has hurt us so badly God loved them enough to die for them, just like us. We do not deserve God's forgiveness, neither do they. But we still have God's forgiveness. If God can forgive this individual, surely we, who have been wronged less than God, can forgive them. How could we not? The one who died for us, the one we claim to love, loves them. How could we not love them? My brother-in-law recently got married. Because I'm contractually obliged to care for him, I must care for his new bride as well. 
His love for her compels my love for her. The fact that she's pretty awesome is just a bonus. On the subject of love and forgiveness, we could look at probably the most complete explanation of how we should love as Christians. And we would see that forgiveness is integral to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 7 says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Notice that in verse 5, it says we must not be resentful, which in other versions is translated, keeps no record of wrongs. Are, are we keeping a list? Do we recall all the wrongs done to us? I'm fortunate that my memory is terrible. I genuinely forget the wrongs that I have suffered, not out of my own goodness, but my brain's incompetence. My gran, however, could remember every wrong done to her all the way back to primary school and beyond. They tormented her, wrongs not dealt with. It must have been exhausting. Notice too in verse 7 that love bears all things and endures all things. Not endures a lot, not endures most, but endures all. Okay, so we are not to have these negative thoughts about someone. But surely I'm allowed to vent to as many people as I can about them. After all, I'm just warning them of what this person is like. How about we answer that by reading James chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against his brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? James is clear that we are not to speak evil against another. We are not to slander them. We are not to backbite or talk about them to others. There's a lesson my parents taught me when I was growing up. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Is it true? Well, partly. James says we shouldn't speak evil of someone. But that... Does that mean that we can't speak to them about our heart? No. In fact, we're told to do so. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, Take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax corrector. Examine the biblical standard though. Go to them yourself first, then take others, Pick carefully who. Then take it to the church as a whole. I've seen so many examples of Christians not following this principle 
and it going terribly? When will we learn to do things God's way? I digress. We are not told to keep going back to them ourselves until we harass the response we want out of them. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. There is expectation of reconciliation in the church. Many scholars uh, look at this passage and think it refers to the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. His crime was great, and yet when he repented, he was brought back into the church. And here Paul is telling them to comfort him. Note the warning at the end of the passage though. The devil will use our lack of forgiveness against us. But, you cry, they keep doing the same things over and over again. Surely I only have to forgive them once. Then it is open season on their evil. Peter had the same objection in his heart. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So does that mean once they've reached the 77 or 190, depending on how that verse is translated, uh, could be 70 times 7, uh, across the course of their lives, then I can go wild. And my brain starts trying to split one wrong into 10 so I can hit that number quicker. Um, no. Uh, Jesus is saying that there is always to be forgiveness. We're not to be putting limits on our forgiveness. Jesus doesn't. We would be in real trouble if he did. Just read Luke chapter 17 verses 1 through 4. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. Jesus is all too aware that Christians are going to cause problems amongst themselves. He doesn't say that the offences we give are okay. This is pretty strong language he uses. But after all is said and done, forgiveness is to be given. Seven times a day. If we only meet once a week at church, over a lifetime of church attendance, the person who offends you is given forgiveness around 18,000 times, assuming 50 years of church life. You're not expecting maths in this message, were you? The point is that we are to have a low bar for the behaviour of others to us and a high bar of how we treat them. No matter what a brother or sister in Christ does to us, no matter how often they hurt us, we are expected and commanded to forgive them 
if we are to have a good relationship with our God. We are often warned about extremism and extremists, but I am telling you that God wants extreme Christians, extreme in love, extreme in service, extreme in obedience, and extreme in forgiveness. I tell you that the extreme level of love and forgiveness is not just limited to other Christians either. Proverbs 24 verse 17 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Do we get a smile when we hear that someone who has treated us badly gets their just desserts? The boyfriend who dumped you to go off with some floozy gets dumped by her for some rich old guy. Perhaps it is the boss who fired you now is being found out by his boss because you're not covering his incompetence anymore. But we are not just to abstain from negative thoughts towards our enemies, but we are to actively seek their good. Just read Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. This thought is repeated in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 45. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Notice the pray for them statement in both those verses. Are we doing this for people who have hurt us, Christian or not? Are we lifting them up to God in prayer? And I don't mean, God, please teach Billy a lesson about being nice. Or, God, please make Sally realise she is a terrible human being. Perhaps if we lift them up to God in prayer and actively seek good things for them, going out of our way to help them, to overcome evil with good, perhaps then our feelings will follow our actions, as they often do. Act as if you love them, and you may end up really loving them. Wouldn't that be a modern day miracle? Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honourable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When God says, vengeance is mine, did we believe him? Do we have enough faith in our God to believe him when he speaks? Forgiveness is not just an obedience thing, nor is it a love thing, it is a faith thing. Do we have enough faith to forgive? Can we trust our God enough to hand over the hearts we have to him and be healed? Or must we have control of our own? Our pride causes the heart to be remembered, to be paid for. 
How often does our own self-reliance and pride stop us from handing our lives fully to God and his will, his way? I, I can hear you say, I can't. I know I should. I know I must, but I don't have the strength to let go. I hear and I understand. But don't forget Matthew chapter 19, verses 25 and 26. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Not just some things, not just the easy things, not just the natural things. I'm not saying that the hearts will not hurt. I'm not saying that there will not be consequences that still affect you. Christ still bears the scars of Calvary. I often joke that scars are cool, but wounds of obedience are glorious. Scars of forgiveness are noble. Wounds of love are beautiful. I'm going to temper this teaching with wisdom, hopefully. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We are to be wise in our dealings. Forgiveness and reconciliation does not mean that we are to be a doormat for the abuses of others. We are to be meek, not weak. They're not the same thing. An abused person should not willingly be alone with the person who abused them. If I were to lend money some, to somebody and never got it back, I would not lend to them again. This is not the same thing as unforgiveness. This is wisdom. Do not let a wicked person use scripture out of context to browbeat you into doing something unwise. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 3 says, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. That phrase goes, go on suggests doing the same thing over and over again, repeating our mistakes. We're not supposed to make the same mistakes over and over again. We can have a relationship with someone without having to bend to their will. Love is not doing what the other person wants, but love is doing what is best for that person. And sometimes what is best for the person is to stand up to them and say no, to ensure they do not step beyond their rightful authority or walk down a path that will lead to their harm without being warned of the consequences. To conclude, I will read Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. What I think this verse is getting at is give others the grace that God gave us. That is Christian forgiveness. Thanks for watching. I just want peace. Turns out resentment is corrosive and I hate it. Me too.